So it's June 2016 and the morning after the Brexit referendum. I'm sat in my living room with my dad, trying to take in everything that's just been announced, along with probably everyone else in the country. And then with one of the most British reactions I've ever seen to anything, my dad got up, said, still, at least we're doing well in the cricket, <laughs> and went to make a cup of tea. It was a historic day, there's no doubt about that, and England went on to thump Sri Lanka by 10 wickets in that day's ODI. For me, that day started a concern that's kind of become a bit of a fascination. Earlier that month, Michael Gove said that the people of this country have had enough of experts. It was a worrying statement, but what was more worrying was how true that actually was. The referendum of 2016 was a torrid affair with half-truths and full lies from both sides of the campaign. But what concerned me was that no one was checking what they were hearing and reading. No one was wanting to make sure that there was an ulterior motive, or even if things were accurate. I think we need to be more aware of where and how we consume our information. And these days, if it isn't written on the side of a bus, that tends to be online. So in August 2018, Donald Trump said on Twitter, where else, that Google was rigged. He was saying that the search engines, our doorways to the internet, are biased. I agree with him. As a digital marketer, someone who works day in and day out with the Google algorithm, I can tell you that it is biased. What I mean by this is that the search results are unfair, they aren't equal, and they are weighted towards particular results. But the thing is, we want the search engines to be biased. That's why we use them. There's a whole lot of information out there at the moment. The Googles and the Bings of this world have incredible indexes. With over 5.2 billion pages in those as of April 2019. Now that's a lot to sort through. So what the search engines do, rather than just chucking a load of pages at us, is they try and work out which are actually relevant for what we're looking for. And technically, that brings in a bias. They then take these relevant results and try and put them in an order with the most relevant ones first. More bias comes in here. Yet this is what we want. I'm going to talk predominantly about Google because 92% of all the searches that are done worldwide are on this one platform. It's also become a verb. It would sound really weird if I told you to bing something, wouldn't it? <laughs> Doesn't sound right. But the principles are the same for all the search engines. So let's say you went and you did a Google search for the actress Anna Kendrick. Now, the intent here is to find out more about her, knowing that she's 157 centimeters tall from Maine and was in Pitch Perfect is all relevant. You can find that on the first result. But if you go outside the top 100 results, you can get the cast for Tall Girl, which she isn't in. So it's not really that relevant. So this bias, which is positive, in that it's convenient for us, has come under fire quite a lot lately. And this is where I stop agreeing with President Trump. See, it's become very popular these days to say that news you don't like is fake news, and the places that share them are biased. The tweet that Trump sent actually said that 96% of results for Trump news are from national left-wing media, very dangerous. Google and others are suppressing conservative voices and hiding information and news that is good. It's a common argument, and it's wrong. Very easy to come up with 96% of left-leaning sources, when it's just one person's opinion and they happen to label quite a lot as being left. There will also be negative articles if you keep attacking the people who write them, calling them fake news because you disagree. And here's a shocking thought. If you didn't do bad things, there wouldn't be any bad articles to return. The figure of 96% and the report it came from have been largely discredited. It just isn't accurate. But rather than checking it, he just tweeted it because the Donald was a victim of confirmation bias. It matched what he thought or wanted to be true, so it must be. But it does still raise an interesting question, and that's whether you could engineer a search engine, if the search engine themselves could have a particular political outlook. Now, theoretically, yes, they could do this, but practically, in the real world, they don't. 
And a single rogue agent working at one of the search engines couldn't change this. Google has a huge team working on its algorithm. This gets updated about 600 times a year and runs to 2 billion lines of code, which is 5,000 times longer than that used for the space shuttle. One person alone couldn't change this, which means it would have to be a company-wide initiative, for which I can't find any real substantive evidence of this happening. So the search engines themselves are neutral and without a political bias. But it can often be argued that there is a political slant to the results that we're seeing. This is because there is one, and it's one that we, the users, give to it. So the perfect search engine, according to Google's co-founder Larry Page, understands exactly what you mean, gives you back exactly what you want. What this means is that they're continually monitoring interactions on a site. If a site gets clicked a lot from the search results, that's a good sign. If people stay on that page, they don't bounce off straight away, that's an even better one. If there's generally good engagement on that site and people share a link to it elsewhere, that's a brilliant sign. And so as a result for that search term, this result will appear in the prominent positions because it's giving us what we need. It's understanding what we want. And that makes the provider the perfect search engine. And then we go back to them as opposed to a competitor. Now, Alphabet Inc., which is Google's parent company, had a total revenue of $136.8 billion in 2018. An astonishing 86% of that came from the paid search and display network on the world's favorite search engine. That's despite pretty much everyone saying they don't click on the ads. That's fake news. You can see why they want people to come back because then they can offer the advertisers an unrivaled market audience. It does also ask the question, though, as to what's the most important thing, whether it's the utility of the platform or is it just the cash money. Basically, we influence things. If we were to all go and click on a certain group of sites, they would return in prominent positions. If we were to do a search by a politician by name, and we were to go and click on all the pages to do with their recent expenses scandal, they would appear in the high places. Now, that's because that's what we're after. It's relevant. It's what we, the public, want. It's not political bias, per se, but to the uninitiated, it can look like that, particularly if search results for their opponent or their opposition are only positive. By using Google, you are influencing it. We are the bias. There is another way that users can affect the search results, and this one does tend to be a little bit more political. In 2018, there were a couple of massive spikes in search traffic for the search term idiot. And the more people who found out why, the more people searched for it. Because if you did a search term on Google Images for idiot, you got loads of pictures of Donald Trump. <laughs> there he is. And that was funny, so we all did it. Now, immediately, there were elements of Capitol Hill that were calling bias at Google, saying that this was a clear attempt at the search engine to take a political stance. But it wasn't. This is what's known as a Google bomb. So this is when people try to get a particular result, either a website or an image, to rank highly for a phrase that is irrelevant. George W. Bush and Tony Blair have been the victims of negative Google bombs in the past as well. And there was a group of activists who attempted to take over the search results successfully for a little while for EDL to show English disco lovers as opposed to the English Defense League. <laughs> the more people who heard about the Trump Google bomb, the more people searched for it, which then meant it became relevant again and so returned in the prominent positions or for a little while at least, because the search engines don't really like this gaming of the system, and they tend to change the results for the Google bomb to articles about it instead. That's why if you were to do a Google image search now for idiot, you would still get a couple of pictures of Donald Trump, but they'll all be from articles to do with the original Google bomb, which is slightly ironic and quite meta. <laughs> but there is another set of actors at play here as well, and that would be the websites themselves. 
they can manipulate the Google algorithm. I know this because this is my job. <laughs> I help websites appear higher on Google. It's called search engine optimization. Now, when I do it, it's to help businesses make more money online, but it's the exact same principle for if you're doing it for political or even more nefarious means. Search engine optimization, or SEO, love an acronym in our industry. SEO is an educated guesswork. The key word obviously being educated. What I mean by this is that there are over 200 unique ranking factors that Google uses when checking a website and trying to decide where to rank. Probably less than 5% of these have ever been confirmed. It's not really in their interest to give us the recipe. Because then we'd be making perfect websites for Google, and that makes it hard for them to decide what to rank where. Although, the secrecy around it does make it a little tricky for them when questions like this come up. But there are some things that we do know. We know that content is king, so having the right words in the right places makes a big difference. How fast a page loads, the speed of everything, that has an impact too. Likewise, the links and the quality of those links coming in from the rest of the web, we've been able to work out quite a lot as an industry. Media sites and politicians can get in on this as well. SEO isn't easy, but why not put in that hard graft to appear in the prominent positions for the campaign topics that you're really going to make a stand on? The algorithm is there for anyone to manipulate it. So basically, no, there's no such thing as a neutral, unbiased, unpolitical search engine. What we need to do is decide if this is a good thing or not. Now, for me, it is, because this gives us that convenience that we crave. But what if we decide that, no, we don't want that. We want everything to be equal and just and fair and apolitical. How would we go about addressing this bias? It strikes me we have a couple of options. The first is that we can stop using the search engines. But let's be honest, we're not going to do that. Particularly when you consider that there will have been 68.4 million searches done on Google alone just whilst I've been talking. It's a fair few. It is far more likely that I will get struck by lightning whilst drowning than we stop using the most important tools on the web. It's one in 183 million, just in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> uh, there was a two-minute window on the 16th of August 2013 when Google was down. In that time, there was a 40% drop in global internet traffic. These things are just too essential for us not to use them. So that's not really an option. We can't do that. What we could do is look to get some legislation in place. Maybe have some government bodies to kind of keep, a, keep tabs on everything. In fact, that's something that's been proposed right here in the UK and could be on the way soon. But again, I don't like this. This isn't a solution that works. These are international companies, and the internet covers the entire globe. Who has the jurisdiction where? It's a legislative and logistical nightmare. It also runs contrary to the very principles of the internet. Back in 1996, John Perry Barlow created his defiant statement the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, in which he described the web as a world where all may enter without privilege or prejudice accorded by race, economic power, military force, or station of birth. It's a world where the governments of the industrial world, what Barlow called these weary giants of flesh and steel, have no sovereignty. Doesn't policing the search engines kind of run contrary to this freedom of the internet? Now, over in the States, the search engines have Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, uh, that they can use as a support. This basically says that they, along with social networks, are not liable for what other people say on their platform. Google isn't a publisher. It's merely a messenger. Bringing in legislation fundamentally changes that. Not to mention the fact that in the, in the US, it would be fundamentally unconstitutional to have a government body controlling the search results, violating, as that would, the First Amendment. There's another problem as well. There is. It's that the governments have proven they just don't have the knowledge to take the task on. If you've seen the congressional session where Google CEO Sundar Pichai testified before the House Judiciary Committee, 
it was, it was a shambles. Here was an opportunity for them to ask some real pressing questions, massive questions. But instead, they used it as an opportunity for partisan arguments and, well, bias, ironically. One congressman was told by Mr. Pichai that a single person at Google could not change the search results before he replied to the CEO of the company in question to say that he believed they could. And another used it basically as a tech support session for his iPhone, which is made by another company. However, this failing in knowledge from our elected officials does point us towards where the answer is, and it lies in education. Now, whether that is the education of the government so they can police these things properly, or if it is education of the people so that everyone can understand a little bit more of how this all works, that's up for debate. Arguably, we could do both. And even if we decide that we like this bias, we still need to know about this. That's probably even more important. We're never going to know exactly how these search engines work in the same way that no company is going to give us all the details of their intellectual property. But we do know enough to understand how we get our search results. It's something we all need to learn so that we can become informed skeptics. In a time of shock politics, where if you aren't with me, then you're against me, and everyone, not mentioning any names, is tweet first, ask later, <laughs> perhaps this little bit of knowledge can just help redress this state of affairs and help make sure that we are never again taken in by something that we read online or on the side of a bus without questioning it first. Thank you.